This is a special presentation of ABC News. The Persian Gulf, images of a conflict. A conversation with Allied Commander General Norman Schwarzkopf, conducted in March 1991. Here is ABC's Barbara Walters. Seven months ago, he was an unknown four-star general. Today, 56-year-old General H. Norman Schwarzkopf needs no introduction, and so we present an in-depth interview without a lengthy introduction. Our conversation took place four days ago in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. The only thing you have to know, and you'll see why, is that this commander-in-chief of the Allied forces in the Persian Gulf likes to be called the bear, and he doesn't care if it's a teddy bear or, as the enemy now knows, a grizzly bear. General, these men are with you all the time? They're with me 24 hours a day. He's guarded day and night, even in his own headquarters. We're several stories underground. The location is secret. Security is a joint responsibility, Americans and Saudis. The American members of the team have rotated, but the Saudi members of the team have been with me for seven months now. And they take very, very good care of me. He lives and works in this underground cloister. During the war, he told me, he rarely saw daylight. His most intense work was done at the end of this hallway, where security was at its tightest. This is the war. And this is the war room. This is where it all happened. This is the first time General Schwarzkopf has allowed a camera crew to tour his war room. I would sit in that chair right there. Bob Johnson's the chief of staff. Bird is the director of operations. And then what you have is back all around the back wall over there, all the various staff directorates who would be here and there would be a representative from all of them here at any given time. What you have up here is uh, we would generally have uh, three or four different maps. So one map is the ground operations. What's so this? This is the location of all the friendly forces. So we'd have the location of all the friendly troops where they were located. Over here would generally be the intelligence map where we'd have the location of all the enemy forces. And this constantly changes. You sit here in front of you and as the situation changes, it's posted. Red phone for the president? Red phone, well, the red phone, normally for Colin Powell, but I can oh. talk straight hotline to Colin Powell, hotline Secretary of Defense, or for that matter, hotline to the White House if I need to. Did you talk to the president often? Uh, no, not often. Uh, he uh, called me, I've talked to him, I guess, three times since I've been over here. How often did you talk to Colin Powell? Every single day. At least, I, I, I would say at least once a day, but sometimes it was three and four and five times a day. Mm -hmm. Now, this, this is a tactical radio system, and on this radio system I could talk down, right down to the tactical commanders in the field if need be. Who is this little fellow? That's a bear. That's, well, that's a baby grizzly bear. He, that's a baby he grizzly lives bear. here? He, he lives here. This has been his spot since the... Uh, he took up that position on the day that we started the, uh, the uh, strategic bombing campaign and has never left that spot since. This was a gift to me uh, from my sister for Christmas. Would you like to see him work? Uh, yes, sir. Yeah. <laughs> Is that the way you sign, General, when you're really giving orders? Any resemblance is purely coincidental. I want you to know that. That's... I should ask you, is that the way you sign? Just as he said. <laughs> be, be careful how you answer that, Bert. <laughs> Remember, you could be over here a long time, Bert, right? <laughs> Norman Schwarzkopf not only talks tough, he is. Tough as nails, say those who work with him. But I discovered a vulnerable side, too, to this veteran soldier. When we sat down to talk, my very first question evoked an emotional response. General, you have two daughters and a young son. What did you say to your 13-year-old son when you left to come here and begin a war? I got the family together. Uh, they, they didn't have any idea I'd be leaving as soon as I would. As a matter of fact, I think they really thought, uh, because, I, because Central Command has been run from, from Tampa, Florida, I think that in their minds, they thought that I was going to be running this whole thing from Florida. So they had, they didn't really know when I was going to be leaving. But a couple of days before it was time to leave, I got the whole family together. And I just told them that what was going to happen. I told them it was my job. Uh, that I was proud to be doing it. I wanted them to understand why. And I wanted them to be proud of me for doing it. And that was it. You miss them a lot, I can tell. Yeah. yeah, I do. Take me back the first night, the first night that our bombs were sent uh, to Baghdad. Where were you? What were you doing? What were you feeling? 
We, of course, knew what time the first shots would be fired, 20 minutes to 3 in the morning. Um, knew exactly who was going to fire them. And so I assembled the staff downstairs at 2.30 in the morning in the war room. Chaplain was there. Uh, had the chaplain say a little prayer uh, for the protection of our, uh, our servicemen and women. And then we played uh, Lee Greenwood's God Bless the USA. And uh, we did. Anybody who knows me knows that I love that song. Uh, but that was sort of what it was all about. And, and, then, and then we just said, OK, now let's go to work. And uh, at 20 minutes to 3, uh, we got the reports that the first shots had been fired, and uh, that started it. I know this is a strange question to ask a general, but were you ever scared? Sure. When most? I've, I've been scared in every war I've ever been in. What was Saddam Hussein's biggest mistake? His predictability. His predictability? His I always predict thought he was so unpredictable. Everybody uh, says we don't know him, we don't know what makes him do things. We, we studied the Iran-Iraq campaigns very, very carefully. And, and uh, based upon the Iran-Iraq campaigns, we came up with a lot of assumptions of what they would do. And we weren't wrong a single time. By the way, General, what do you think is going to happen to those Iraqi planes in Iran? I think they're going to stay there. So if uh, Saddam Hussein is as predictable as you said, uh, why did Saddam Hussein send those planes to Iran? Well, I don't think he did. Oh. I, I, my, my, um, my feeling is that he, he they went to Iran and, and got a, a gentleman's agreement for what that's worth uh, to send their commercial airplanes over there. So their commercial airplanes all flew over to Iran and were safe. I think the first group of pilots that went over there uh, with their military aircraft recognized very quickly that, uh, that they would take off and, and die uh, if they fought us. And therefore, they uh, said, well, gee, if these other airplanes are going over there, we can scoot on over there also. I think that's probably what started the floodgates open. Uh, and they're going to stay there. I don't think there's any question about that. General, how do you feel about the, the uh, American armchair television analysts who fought the war for us every day with maps? Truth. <laughs> uh, most of them, most of them were a joke. Most of them, uh, and and I and I and a lot of them are my friends. So I, I don't want to give the wrong impression. But but uh, you know some of the analysis that uh, you heard was ludicrous. They didn't know what was going on. They didn't have the facts at hand, um, and. Uh, and they were talking about stuff that uh, it didn't make any sense. Uh, uh, some of them I resented. I resented the fact that, uh, that they had served in our military and received military training for, for, for a great number of years. And then they were using that military training to guess openly uh, on television uh, what I was going to do, what we were going to do over here on a program that they knew very well was being monitored by the enemy. Uh, I, I, I find that that's difficult for me to reconcile in my sense of values, uh, why anyone would do that. There were some that were very good, and I don't want to get into names, OK? But there were some that I thought uh, were very helpful in their analysis. So they were careful to, to, I think, explain to the American public what was going on, but they were not they were not uh, g going beyond that point to predict what was going to happen or to predict the reasons why, so on and so forth. When in the middle of the war you looked up on your television screen and you saw Peter Arnett at CNN and other reporters in, in Baghdad, tell me how you felt. Was that helpful? Was that harmful? Did it bother you? It's something that's still a matter of controversy in our country. When Peter Arnett first started making his broadcast from Baghdad, it didn't bother me a bit. Subsequently, there was a lot of resentment uh, on my part and on the part of my entire staff. And that's when, that's when the broadcast turned to the Iraqis running the team out, showing them a civilian target that had been heavily bombed and said, you see there, uh, the implication was almost as if we were lying to the American people when we were saying that we were deliberately trying not to target civilian targets. And, and that, that resulted in a great deal of resentment on the part of, of myself and my staff. Because, of course, they didn't run out and say, here's military targets that have been totally destroyed, or here's a military. It was all the, the implication that was there that we were deliberately doing that kind of thing. And that was resented by every member of my headquarters, because it simply was not 
a true picture of what was going on. And, and please don't misunderstand. I have great respect for Peter Arnett, and I have great respect um, for the press and the American people's right to know. But, but, but there was something about that uh, that, that, that still bothers me a great deal. General, take us to that meeting with the Iraqi generals. We all saw the pictures. We haven't heard that much about it. I want to know how you felt when you saw these generals. What did you say to them? Were there any surprises? Take us to that tent. Let me tell you what happened before that, because it, it, it had a bearing. We flew into Kuwait to land, and uh, because you fly, obviously, into the wind, all the black smoke was blowing directly at the airplane, and we descended we descended into this black smoke where you couldn't see anything. And then suddenly I was looking out the window, and you could just make the ground out, and there were these huge balls of fire. And, and it was, I was totally unprepared for the scene. And, and the first thing that flashed in my mind is if I ever, if I ever visualized what hell would look like, this is it. These and, are the oil fields burning? Yeah, this is the oil yeah. fields that were burning. This is south of Kuwait City now. And it was so senseless. I mean, it absolutely was senseless destruction. Uh, in, in, by every definition, I mean, it, it, it would accomplish nothing. And, and so by the time I landed at South One, now I was angry. I mean, I thought, why, why would anybody do something like this? You know, it really was a, a sense of anger at this, this senseless destruction. And um, so, but, but, uh, but it was very important, I felt, that, uh, that whatever we did, this, this, this uh, discussion should not be one of humiliation. I, I, I'm not too sure what they expected. Because when they arrived, they were, of course, in their, their, their uh, not their full dress uniforms, but they were in, a, in dress uniforms with shoulder, you know, boards on and their ribbons and all this sort of business. And, and they got out, and I was standing there like this. And, uh, and your I... your Sunday best. Yeah, my Sunday best. I mean, I just... Uh, you were clean? I mean, <laughs> clean, yeah. I'd showered the night before, right. Shay. But, uh, but the, uh, I, had a, I had a young American interpreter who went to the general, and we'd already decided that everyone who went in that tent would be searched electronically. And the general didn't think too much of that idea. And, uh, and uh, then uh, I told the Air Force Major to tell him, well, that's all right, but that's what was going to happen anyhow, and that I would be the first one to be searched. And he immediately looked at me and said, well, the only person that's going to search me is my counterpart. And we said, well, who, who, what do you mean by your counterpart? And he said, the person that's going to negotiate. And I said, I'm the person that's going to negotiate. And the guy, he, he, he kind of looked down at my boots, and then he looked up and up at me again, and he looked down, and he said, well, who are you? And I said, I said I'm General Schwarzkopf. And this transpired, and he said, oh, all right. He hadn't even seen your picture? I, I, I don't know whether he'd seen my You're picture. You're not famous I, in, but in I'm, Baghdad? I, apparently I'm not famous in Baghdad. But that did, I mean, it was just sort of funny that I think that, I think that he didn't expect the guy to be out there and in the same uniform that all the rest of the troops were in, uh, to be the person that was going to be negotiating, or, or not negotiating, but discussing with him. I understand that the one place that they were surprised was when you gave them the number of the Iraqi POWs. They had said, we are now ready to give you the numbers, and, and we said, fine. And he said, we have 41 POWs, and he gave us a breakdown by country, and he interrupted me. And he said, uh, would you mind telling us how many prisoners you have? And I said, uh, well, as of last night, we had 60,000, but we're still counting. And, and you, the entire delegation, you could just see a, th there was a sense of, of, of you know, they, they all kept a poker face, but you could tell that every one of them just immediately tensed. Do you think that they knew then that they really were defeated when Saddam Hussein was still saying, this is a glorious war, we have fought valiantly, we have won? I mean, did it sink in? Very early on, they they tried to say that they were withdrawing, you know, that they had voluntarily withdrawn. And I, but I wasn't about to accept that at that point. I just said, you know, um, I just said, uh, you know, we could probably argue from now until sunset as whether or not uh, what you were doing was withdrawing. And then therefore, we're not here to discuss that. We're here to discuss the arrangements that will make sure that we continue to seize the offensive. So let's get on with that. And you know, I don't want to discuss that. If you could meet Saddam Hussein, what would you ask him What's say to him? Get out of town. The men and women of 